We're so glad that you're here for our first of the 2019 Lenten Luncheon Series. Um, I have to say, uh, for those of you, I've had some people speak to me aside about um, needs and customs around the event, but first and foremost, I want to welcome you once again. Um, uh, a year ago, um, in April, um, the former administrator here at First Lutheran, Jim Benson, unfortunately died very suddenly, and we are still mourning our, that loss around that man and his ministry. And this event was largely due to Jim, and he he um, customized it and invited the speakers. So I have taken over that for this year along with the staff. So please give us a birth of forgiveness if we do something that Jim did not. That, that, Jim, that Jim did sort of, you know, innately. And so uh, we do know that you want to know what the upcoming events are and the meals are. And so I will tell you, we do have a flyer um, that we'll give you before you leave. Um, it is on our website. It is on our Facebook page. It is in the hallways. It, there are, in fact, two vinyl signs on the fence outdoor that just did, are general announcements for not only today, but our Wednesday events. Um, um, Next week's lunch is a boiled lunch um, and in celebration of uh, St. Patrick's Day. Um, and Jean Ellen Newlett Kinney can come in here and tell you more about that lunch specifically if you want to know. Our speaker next week is Pastor Matthew Martin, who is the director of um, Feed New England in New England Hunger. Um, he's a Lutheran pastor, but he primarily, well, solely does this now. And he has done, I know, in the time I've been here, already surpassed is a millionth meal that he has fed people just here in New England. He's an amazing, amazing man and speaker in ministry. We also have Anne um, Beauregard with the Brockton City Council. Um, we have uh, Lynn Smith, who just took a picture of me here with the Keith Park Association. She's going to be speaking. Um, also, um, Mary Beth O'Brien with Gilmore School. And also ending up is Steve Domish, who is the former editor of the Brockton Enterprise. And he is pretty amazing. I am look, looking forward to that. So as always, bring a friend. It's a great meal. Lasagna, thumbs up. Woo, yes. Yes, OK. And all handmade by those lovely ladies next door. So uh, please thank them you know, once again on the way out. So Dawn is passing out cards. If you want to give me information, if you want to be on a mailing list, if you want me to call you, um, I try to put things between these two categories. If it's a lament, which is a sadness, please let me know, or a complaint. I love laments. Complaints sometimes I can't deal with, but, but if you've got something I need to know, put that on the back. But if you've got a dietary concern, if you've got a suggested speaker, or wouldn't it be cool if we did this? Because we, we need to hear those things. Once again, um, thank you, Jean Ellen. Jean Ellen is the vice chair of the council here at First Lutheran and an extraordinary chef and friend of the parish. Um, uh, before we go on, um, I'd like to say um, a grace for today's meal and thanksgiving for it. So let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for today and all the wonders of your world. Thank you for the sunshine and the cool air, the very cold air. Thank you for this meal that we have in front of us, um, lovingly hand, uh, prepared by the hands and hearts of people of this parish. Um, be with us now as we enter um, uh, the world of um, Dr. Rosa and give our hearts and minds that attention to him. Um, and help us to always remember those in need, those who have nothing to eat tonight, and no one, nowhere to what lay their heads. All this we ask through your name that is holy. Amen. Amen. Finally, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, and um, Dr. Joao Rosa with the uh, Bridgewater State University. I'll let him speak more about his background, but he's the director of Cape Verdean Studies at um, the university, and I, what a more appropriate thing to have here than someone speaking to that in Brockton in this community. So uh, help me in welcoming him. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Pastor Johnson for inviting me to come down and have a conversation, a dialogue of sorts. Uh, I'm hopeful that it can actually be a dialogue uh, rather than just me 
standing up here and, and being somewhat boring. I thank you for uh, putting up with me for the next few minutes. And um, I think the way that I'd like to approach this is to tell you a little bit about myself and my background, and then the work that I do. Um, as Pastor Johnson noted, I am the executive director of the Institute for Cape Verdean Studies at Bridgewater State University. Um, now, it is the only such institute in the world, uh, in an institution of higher education. Uh, there is no such uh, institute anywhere in the U.S. or anywhere in the international diaspora, as far as we know. The mission of the institute is a bit broad. Um, but as I said, let me tell you a little bit about my background, uh, and then we can get into the business of the institute. I actually came to the U.S. when I was about 12 years old. Uh, in 1980, my parents came here from Cape Verde. I went through schooling in the city of Brockton. I subsequently did my undergraduate degree at UMass Boston. I did my master's degree in linguistics at UMass Boston. And then I did my PhD at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Um, now, if you know the Midwest at all, you should know that there's a huge difference between Brockton and, and the Midwest. It was kind of uh, sort of putting me in the middle of nowhere with no connections whatsoever to anything. And I spent about 40 years um, at the University of Wisconsin at Madison in an apartment that was pretty big with nothing around me but books and a mattress on the floor. Um, and I ended up getting a PhD in education. Um, upon graduating, I came back to the region. I was a professor, a tenured professor at UMass Dartmouth. Worked there for about six or seven years. Uh, and when the institute was formed um, at Bridgewater State University, the former president called me to run the institute. Uh, now, the reason I tell you about my background is because my background informs a lot of what I do with the institute. Um, so, I'll give you an example. When I was young, I attended a private school, not for formal education, but for some extracurricular activities that was located right here on Warren Avenue. And I could decode English because I could speak Portuguese, I could read and write French. Um, so I could decode English, but I didn't really understand English. And every day I'd go into a room, I would see on the wall a quote by Harry David Thoreau. And the quote was fairly simple, and I read it so many times that I ended up memorizing the quote. And it basically said this, if a man walks to the beat of a different drum, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music he hears, however measured or far away. And of course I could read this thing, but I never really understood you know, the significance of it. And I think to a huge extent, what we do at the Institute is essentially that. We try to document the journey of Cape Verdeans to this region. Most people, uh, of course, you know the city of Brockton is very diverse. <clears throat> at least as far as we know, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, there are about some 33,000 Cape Verdeans in Brockton. Um, yeah, there are about some 33,000. I mean, if you look at any hallway in the school systems, if you walk through any hallway in the school systems, this will be immediately visible to you. Um, but there isn't much understanding about Cape Verdeans. Uh, we know that the Cape Verdeans exist here, but we don't really have a sort of a historical understanding of Cape Verdeans. Uh, and this can be illustrated very easily. The first documented Cape Verdean to come to the U.S., I asked this question the other day of someone. They said, well, it was probably in the early 1900s, you know. In actuality, it was in 1638. 
1638. I mean, think about this thing. 1638. 18 years after the pilgrims landed, right? According to historical record. Matthias de Souza landed. He was an indentured servant uh, for a Jesuit missionary. And he was in the state of Maryland, right? The, the uh, territory of Maryland in 1638, earned his freedom in 1641. 1642, he was elected to a local assembly. 1642. That to me is astonishing. In 1850, the first person of color, other than the Native Americans, in Seattle, was a Cape Verde in 1850. His name was Manuel Lopsch, owned a barber shop. The first person of color in Seattle. Again, to me that's amazing. That's positively amazing that the history goes back so far. If you know anything about the history of the region, which I assume everyone here knows, twice in the history of the world, New Bedford has been the richest city per capita in the world, twice. Once through the whaling era, once when whaling was the main industry, and again through the textiles. So two times in the history of the world, New Bedford has been the richest city per capita in the world. Cape Verdeans, had a lot to do with this thing. If you read Melville, Melville actually has instances in Billy Budd that he talks about uh, a seaman on board of the boat who was actually of Cape Verdean descent. So Cape Verdeans have been around for a long time and they have served in every possible sector, every sphere of life that you can think of. So, for example, you have records of Cape Verdeans serving in the military in the Revolutionary War. Now, if you talk to most people about this in Brockton, um, there isn't a historical understanding, right? There isn't a, an understanding of the historical trajectory of Cape Verdeans in the region. In the military, the Cape Verdeans go back all the way to the Revolutionary War. There's documented evidence that shows that Cape Verdeans fought in the Revolutionary War. Well, if they fought in the Revolutionary War, they have fought in every war since then. The War of 1812, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq. Right now, Major General Gary Brito it's Cape Verdean, serves in Fort Benning. He has a command post in Fort Benning. So, in every possible sphere, Cape Verdeans have contributed somehow to the development of US culture. Going back to the late 1600s, again, well, actually mid 1600s. Some people like jazz, if you like jazz, if you're a lover of jazz, Horace Silver was Cape Verde. Horace Silver wrote songs for my father. Songs for my father is a standard of jazz. Now, when I say a standard of jazz, I'm not talking about any particular composition that you hear since 2014, Songs for My Father has been, oh, till 2014, Songs for My Father had been re-recorded by different artists 187 times. 187 times. It is an amazing piece of work. Horace Silver. Coincidentally, Horace Silver is the cousin of another very famous composer of Cape Verde, Adalberto Silva from the island of Mayo, who is more commonly known in Cape Verdean circles as Betu, who has written some beautiful compositions. Right? 
So, in every possible sphere, Cape Verdeans have contributed. Now, sticking to this realm of music, um, if anyone, again, this is the jazz, Paul Gons House. Paul Gons House. If you haven't heard of Paul Gons House, try looking them up on YouTube or something. Duke Ellington, the resurgence of Duke Ellington happened primarily because of a solo that Paul Gonsalves did at the Newport Jazz Fest for Duke Ellington. The video of this is available online if anybody would like to see it. I highly encourage you to, to check it out. Um, so Cape Verdeans have contributed to, in every possible sphere, the clergy. In New Bedford, some people don't know, there, there was a, a preacher. They used to be called uh, Charles Grace, Sweet Daddy Grace. Now, some people called him a preacher. He was thought of as a preacher. Some people thought he was a charlatan and whatnot. But the point of the matter is today, there are offshoots of his church stretching all the way down to South Carolina. All the way down to South Carolina, you have offshoots of Big Daddy Grace's church that was originally based out of New Bedford. So, the job of the Institute is to preserve this history, is to capture it, preserve it, share it, so that our youth and our people and other people can understand what it is that Cape Verdeans have contributed to the region. I am extremely excited. Uh, I don't know if you happen to notice, uh, a couple of weeks ago there was an article on the Enterprise about some teachers going to Cape Verde, some Brockton teachers who are going to Cape Verde. For me, this is very exciting. It's very exciting because when I came to the US, I could speak no English. And very often in my classrooms, obviously the teachers had a very difficult time relating to me because they couldn't communicate with me. And the system was set up a little bit differently. So very often in the background, what happened is, it was as though I faded into the background. It was as though I faded into the background. So. Um, I would secretly be praying that I wouldn't be called upon. The teachers sometimes uh, maybe preferred not to call on me because of the difficulty that we would have in terms of communicating. So, of course, I interpreted that as God answering my prayers, right? <laughs> but it made it very difficult to communicate in class and interact in class. Uh, the ironic thing is, that, of course, later on, professionally, I would end up getting a doctorate degree in education and then end up coming back full circle and writing books criticizing the very system that I was brought up in. Uh, criticizing from the perspective of constructive criticism, right, to try to make the system better. So we have these teachers going to Cape Verde in April. On April 12th, they leave for Cape Verde during April vacation, they come back on April 18th. Now, what's the point of that? Why would the Institute do something like that? Well, in teacher training, when teachers go to education classes, most of the time, in most programs across the country, the teachers would get, will get one course on multicultural education. They will get one course on this thing. That one course is not sufficient for them to truly understand how to interact with the children, the backgrounds of the children, and so forth. Ultimately, this has an effect because if you're unable to reach the students and the students end up dropping out of school, we end up paying for this later on, in one way or another. Now, you can say, well, 
you know, a student who drops out is more likely to engage in criminal behavior, thereby dropping property values down and then affecting the whole city and tax base and all that. But the reality is, is that if you can't reach the students, the students can't succeed. From our perspective is this, rather than relying on your one course on multicultural education, we will bring you to KVER. We'll bring you to KVER. So you can actually see where the students are coming from. You can see where they're coming from. You can talk to their teachers. You can talk to their administrators. You can talk to institutions that deal with schools. So as to learn more about the environment that the students are coming from. Because our hope is that when you come back, you will be a better professional. You will have more ammunition. You will have more tricks of the trades, so to speak. More tools in your toolbox to deal with the students. The beautiful thing uh, is that uh, once this article came out, I reached out to the superintendent of New Bedford and the superintendent of Fall River, and they have both committed to sending teachers next year. So next year, there will be another group from Brockton, another group from New Bedford, and another group from Fall River to go to Cape Verde, to go be immersed in Cape Verdean culture, to understand, to learn, to become better professionals, to become better human beings. So when you come back, the interactions that you have with the students are much more productive. It's not, um, you know, the, some people credit Dr. King with having said something that actually goes back before Dr. King. Uh, that is that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Now, I think it's fitting. It's fitting that in a region that has so many Cape Verdeans, right next door you have 30 something thousand, you go to Boston, you have probably more than that. New Bedford, you have families that go back to the 1800s in the region. Cape area, Wareham, Onset, you have all older generations. I think it's absolutely fitting. It's just that Bridgewater State University uh, took this bold step of creating an institute that can actually document um, the history of Cape Verdeans in the region for the greater grandeur of the entire region. The more that I learn about the Hispanic populations, the more that I learn about the Western European populations, Eastern European populations, the more that I learn about all of the folks that live in this region, I think the greater my humanity, the greater my capacity to engage with people and learn from people and be able to respect people and then have that respect reciprocated because obviously it's a two-way street. Right. Um, I encourage, I, I work on programs um, with youth in the city of Brockton. I've had the, the privilege of being able to do that, to do that for a number of years. Um, and my focus is always the same. You know, my focus is always to tell the youth and to work on the youth on having a stronger sense of identity. The stronger your sense of identity, the less likely it is that you will, in the long run, have any problems with anyone, with law enforcement, with your neighbor, with your uh, kin. It's about having a stronger sense of identity. And fortunately, the Institute allows me to do this work. I have been blessed and, and, and privileged to have been able to, to do this work. Not too long ago, I interviewed a woman in the Cape region 
who was 102 years old. She was blessed, she was 102 years old. And she was telling me about what it was like when she was a young child in the Cape working in the cranberry bonds. What the culture was like, what the environment was like, what it was like to maintain traditions, cultural traditions. At the same time, learning to do something that's very, very critical, which is to selectively appropriate what you need. Now, I'd like to just talk to you just a little bit about this particular notion, because I think it's very, very important. As a Cape Verdean, I can very well be Cape Verdean, and at the same time, absorb everything that is in US culture that I find to be useful in making me a better human being. I don't have to be one or the other. I can be one and still be able to absorb all the rich American cultural traditions. And I think the work of the Institute is about this. It's about documenting this exchange between being Cape Verdean and participating and being part of the U.S. culture. I, Pastor, I don't know how I'm doing on time, so. We need to stop soon. Okay, all right. So, uh, I, I thank you for uh, listening to me and a little bit about the, the work that I do and the reasons why I do it. And any questions that you have, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to uh, stop um, in a, a little hiatus. So are there any questions for Dr. Rosa? Surely, the yes, Peter. When you train teachers, are they being trained to work in America, or are they being trained to go back to Cape Verde to, to teach in, in the homeland? Yeah. Um, to be quite honest, sir, we, we do both. We do both. Now, the teachers that I'm speaking of are U.S. teachers, right? Well, they're U.S. teachers. However, Bridgewater State University does have a program in which we take uh, master's degree students, particularly in the fields of teaching, that come from Cape Verde to do their masters here, and then they end up going back. But the teachers that I'm speaking with about are mainstream teachers, so folks who will be teaching in Boston, in Brockton, in New Bedford, Stoughton, Fall River, New Bedford. This is this is primarily the group that I'm talking about. Other questions? Yes, Lynn. What kind of outreach does the institute do to the public? I mean, are there ways people in the public can get more informed or involved? Thank you so much for that question. Um, actually, the, the best bet, uh, most people have uh, some type of account with Facebook. So you can certainly go to our website, our institutional website at the university, or you can look at our uh, Facebook profile, the Institute uh, profile, uh, the Facebook profile to see upcoming events that we have. Yesterday, for example, we had a wonderful speaker, um, Dr. Richard Loban, who was Professor Emeritus from Rhode Island College, uh, do a talk yesterday, which was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but most of our events will be published through either the institutional website or Great. Anything else? Anybody? No. Wonderful. Um, uh, I've passed around now, Ruth Johnson is passing around schedules for the rest of the series, and I inadvertently and sadly didn't tell you that our own Lynn Smith would be speaking very soon, first week of April. Um, so we're um, excited that she'll be back speaking. Please join us again next week, um, and please bring a friend. Um, I uh, really appreciate you being here. So let's give Dr. Rosa a big hand. And I'm sure he's here available to answer one-on-one -on -one questions too. So thank you.